Good morning. Good morning. I would call your attention to the church calendar for the next week, um, listed on the back side. We have the summer getaway on the front side of the announcements. Um, I was asked to read this, but it's pre everything I was to amend to it. And I don't see any of the kids here regarding um, the change in their Sunday school program. So it's under summer getaway. Next Sunday is uh, June 5th, and it's Pentecost Sunday. And Vacation Bible School begins May 31st at 9 a.m. at the First Mennonite Church here in Halstead. Does anyone have anything else to add to the announcements? I have a quick announcement, and that is that our Theologians and Dialogues small group will be postponed this weekend, this, today, this afternoon, uh, in observance of the Memorial Day weekend. And so if you come to the uh, Theologians and Dialogues small group, don't plan on coming today because I won't be here, and it's likely that nobody else will be here either. And so, uh, so next week, come again, and we'll talk about the Holy Trinity, um, but today it's postponed. Okay.
Great is our God. Let us give our utmost praise to the highest. We honor your steadfast love, O oh God. God is over all the earth. From everlasting to everlasting. God, Let us pray. O oh God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. Do not leave us comfortless, but send us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and exalt us to that place where our Savior Christ has gone before, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. It is such a joy to be joining you today in worship. Those of you who are here gathered in this space, as well as with those of you who are joining us online, wherever you may be. It is such a joy. Did the lights just go out up here? Did anyone notice that? I don't know if that's a sign or something or what, but we'll roll with it. Such a joy to be joining you today for worship, um, especially on this seventh day, seventh Sunday of Easter and this Memorial Day weekend. As we uh, continue in our time of worship and our time of prayer, are there joys or concerns that you would like to lift up today? Yes, Nancy. I have a friend named Diane who is facing um, blood clots in her... You just supposed to wait for me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I have a friend named Diane who is facing blood clots in her... I have a friend named Diane who has blood clots in an artery in her legs and she's had three surgeries and is not doing well. Mm -hmm. So just prayers for Diane. Yes, we'll pray for Diana. Other joys or concerns? Yeah, Shauna. I have joys um, and, and concerns. Obviously concerns for our country and the children. Um, being a school teacher and having children, mm -hmm. and even if you don't, I know that that's a, everyone handles those things differently, but continued prayers for um, our country and our families that are mourning the loss of their children and their teachers. Um, but also joys in that we were at the state track meet this weekend and wrapped up our school year with our um, state track athletes, and they all performed really well and were able to bring home some medals and things like that. So it was fun to be able to still have that celebration for our kids at the same time. Um, so joys and concerns. Yes, thank you for, for lifting up both of those things. I think it's been a while since we've actually been here, so uh, I don't know if anybody knows or anything, but uh, um, uh, my dad is, uh, has been uh, diagnosed with um, lymphoma um, and uh, has gone through a couple treatments seems to be doing pretty well um, he lost his hair it's kind of interesting to see that guy without any hair because he's had nice wavy hair for his entire life so um, but just uh, thoughts and prayers for him and keeping my wife or my wife my mom uh, in your prayers too just helping him out so yes thank you we'll be in prayer for your dad and for your family Kendall, Kendall. Yes, I'd just uh, like to thank you, uh, Pastor, for what you have done to this church and uh, how much uh, you have encouraged so many people. And I am very thankful for being able to uh, be here. I'm not able to come every time, but I am thankful for how much uh, love you show us by teaching us about Jesus Christ. Well, thank you, Kendall. That's very kind of you. And I know that we're all blessed and here by your kindness. Uh, and so we appreciate you, Kendall. All right. I uh, left my bulletin insert at my seat here. But I'll also invite you to be in prayer for uh, Ron Willis, who I understand is out of the hospital and is now uh, in rehab and recovering. Um, 
Also, please be in prayer for Joanne Bergkamp. Um, my grandmother, Linda, is, is doing well. She's back at home. Um, and so I thank you for her prayers. Um, and please be, continue to be in prayer for John Stutzman as he, he recovers for, from surgery. And also continue to keep Betty Stutzman in your prayers as well. There are no other joys or concerns. I'll invite you to join me in a time of prayer. Let us pray together. God of love and compassion, your word brings encouragement and makes our joy complete. What should we do with what we have received from you through your Son, Jesus Christ? Give us humility, God. Give us a Christ-like consciousness so that we may love others as you have loved us. Help us to regard others as better than ourselves and to put our neighbor's interests before our own. Almighty God, your son didn't exploit his special relationship with you to get his way or for his own advantage, but he sought your will and he lived it out to bless the whole of humankind. And so we give thanks for his selflessness and his compassion and his patience. He has exemplified the life of faith so that we may see and walk closely alongside him on our journey of faith. God, as we gather together this Memorial Day weekend, we give thanks to you. We give thanks for all those through whom you have blessed our journey, whose lives that have empowered us, whose lives have influenced us. We give thanks for our dear friends and family members whose faces we see no more, but whose love is forever with us. We give thanks for our teachers and companions and for members of the household of faith, for all those who worship you now in heaven. We give thanks for those who have sacrificed themselves, our brothers and sisters who have given their lives for the sake of others. We give thanks for all these that we may hold them in our continual remembrance and ever think of them as with you in that city whose gates are not shut by day and where there is no night. That we may now be dedicated to working for a world where labor is rewarded, fears dispelled, and nations made one. O oh God, save your people and bless your heritage day by day. We lift your name and we magnify you and worship your name forever and ever. And as we gather, our hearts are open to you and we lift up to you those whose names are upon our hearts, and those who we have concerns for. We pray for those who are struggling, whether that be financially or in other ways. We pray for those who hunger and those who thirst Pray for those who have suffered injustice, who have suffered oppression, who have suffered violence, who have suffered the atrocities of war. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. Pray for those who are sick and those who are ill. That all these know your presence, God. And that your people may be moved to work towards a world in which your justice reigns, in which your love reigns, in which your mercy reigns. God, we lift up those whose names we have lifted by our voices, as well as those names that are in our prayer list and those names that are upon our hearts that have been left unsaid. And we thank you that you hear all of these prayers. We pray that your grace and your presence move us and be with us and guide us and lead us to a place of joy. And and we celebrate joy today and we bring you our joy and we are joyful for our church and our community and, and for time spent with family and friends and birthdays and, and anniversaries and all the opportunities that you give us to to gather and to celebrate you and to celebrate one another. And, 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 And we give thanks, God, that you have called us your children. And it is with this confidence of your children that we pray the prayer taught to us by your son, Jesus, our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. children in the congregation to come forward at this time as we receive the children's message brought to us 
Not by Nikki, but by who? Ward. By Ward. Very good. Looking forward to it. Come up, Ward. Come up, children. Hello, everyone. How you doing? Good. Hey, today you're going to have a great message by pastor. It's about selflessness or just being selfless. Can anyone give me uh, what in your version, what's the definition of selfless? Yeah. Okay. Helping people out. So you're doing something for someone else. So I I used my phone this morning. I looked up the definition of what selfless means. And it means that you are concerned with the needs and the wishes of others more than you are of the needs and wishes of yourself. So um, at a younger age, sometimes that's kind of difficult because we live in a day and age where, you know, sometimes you, you, you want instant gratification or you want it now. And sometimes at a younger age, you might sometimes, uh, you know, be a little self-centered. Think more about yourself than you do of others. Uh, As an adult, you would think that that would start becoming a little easier, right? Uh, Yesterday, my wife and I were having a conversation, and she said, uh, hey, I got to do the children's message. How about you do it? (laughs) And I was like, my first answer was no. Right? And then I began to think of all the things that, that Nikki, my wife, does for this church. And also all the things that she does for our family. And I thought, well, gee, maybe this is a good time for me to be selfless and do something for her as well. Not that I don't do things for you most of the time. <laughs> right? But it was a way for me to be selfless. Um, <clears throat> anyway... Today, what, what, what weekend are we on right now? Memorial. Memorial weekend, right? And Memorial Day weekend, we celebrate a lot of people that were selfless. Maybe some people that fought in foreign wars. Uh, maybe a family love member or, a, you know, a, a family member that we loved dearly or that loved us dearly and was very selfless towards us. So that's one thing that you might do this weekend. You might go visit someone at, the, at, at a grave site and put flowers you know, around uh, their headstone in a way of saying, hey, thank you very much, and being selfless. Uh, what are some ways that you guys can be selfless? Okay. Go ahead. Doing chores without being asked. Okay, that's a good one. Anyone else? Walking your dog, (laughs) mowing the yard, holding a door for someone, little acts of selflessness. Those are all important. You know, we come to church and and we are here and and we honor one of the most, probably the most selfless person, Jesus. Think about all the things he did. He helped people that were sick. He helped people uh, that were in need. Uh, And he searched those people out, and he did what he could. And in the end, he did the most selfless thing, and he did what? He died for us. He He sacrificed his life for us. He gave us grace. So that was the most selfless gift that he possibly could give us. All right, let's go ahead and uh, have a moment of prayer. Anyway, uh, dear God, we want to thank you for this congregation. We want to thank you for family. And we want to thank you for uh, your son that you gave us and how selfless he was to give his, his life for us. And uh, we just want to give a shout out to all the, the members of our family that, we, uh, that, that were selfless towards us. And we ask this in your name. Amen.
Will you please join with me in the prayer for illumination? Save us, good and gracious Lord, from half-heartedness in our service and direction. Help us to find joy in the full use of all that we are and have in the name of Jesus Christ. It is in him that we have peace that surpasses all understanding. Amen. I invite you to rise for the reading of Scripture. We'll be reading Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consultation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God and not regard equality with God and did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Je at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Blessed be our reading of the word. One of, most, one of the most destructive wars in European history took place in the 17th century. It resulted somewhere between 4.5 million and 8 million deaths, reducing the population of Germany by 30%. Nearly a third of Germany's population reduced. It lasted from 1618 to 1648, and history has given this conflict the most creative title I've ever heard for a war, calling it the Thirty Years' War. Any guesses as to why it's called the Thirty Years' War? Lasted 30 years, yep. The Thirty Years' War is a dark period in Christianity. It was fought between Catholics and Protestants, and it was all, there was also inner fighting. It wasn't just Catholics versus Protestants. It was also uh, uh, different groups of Protestants against other groups of Protestants and, and, and certain groups of Catholics versus other groups of Catholics. And it was just an all-out war, and, 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 and it was complex and, and, and bitter. And last week I was thinking about all of this because our theologians and dialogue small group had, had met to explore the topic of baptism, and it immediately became clear to our group um, the differences in how Christian traditions understand baptism and practice baptism, and, and, and how diverse Christianity is in the way that it understands this sacrament. And it occurred to me that these differences were being fought about in the 17th century during that war and even before then, and, 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 and that contributed to the mass bloodshed and, and the chaos of the 17th century. And it was amazing to me that we were able to, as a group, meet and have a friendly conversation about this stuff, disagreeing with one another because we're not, we don't all come from a Methodist background. There are many of us who come from various 
different Christian traditions. There are some of us who come from who don't come from a religious tradition. This is your your first experience with Christianity, and so um, it was amazing to me that we were able to meet in that way and to discuss those 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 topics without. Um, <laughs> without having an all-out religious holy war breaking out in Fellowship Hall. I think that would just be terrible. I mean, we'd, we'd have to rename the room. We couldn't call it Fellowship Hall anymore. We'd have to call it Hostility Hall or something like that. And it, it just doesn't sound as welcoming. The Thirty Years' War demonstrated a time when the church failed to live into its sacred call to unity. And I think that's something that's important to reflect on today, because it's my perception that even today there's a there there's a a misunderstanding to to live in a misunderstanding about unity and what it means to live into unity. And and I think there's a a fairly common notion that unity means sharing the, the same opinion, to share the same understanding, to share the same perspective, and. and and I think that understanding, that notion of unity, stems from our modern way of thinking. It stems from the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment period brought about many changes in our culture, in our society, and um, there are many good things about the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment brought us science and critical thinking and, and universal human rights, but it also brought with it a lot of assumptions. And, and among those assumptions is is one, one assumption that is very prevalent in our society, that if two individuals are asked the same question and given access to the same resources, the same information, the same knowledge, the same evidence, that those two individuals will undoubtedly arrive at the same conclusion. And if they don't arrive at the same conclusion, then one of them must be wrong, especially if those conclusions contradict one another. And given this assumption, one might assume that the greater access we have to information would result in more agreement. But even as our bodies of knowledge have grown, and and even as the internet has provided greater access, endless access, to information, we see that our differences of opinion have only grown deeper. Where there is a sharing of opinion, where there is a sharing of perspective, it's my perception that that has caused even greater division because it's a sign of our human tribal tendencies, our tendency to group together. And when it's groups divided against other groups, things tend to get emotional. There's an emotional aspect that moves people to go on the defensive and justify their opinion. And perhaps that's why there's more fighting in politics than there is actual problem solving. Two sides have developed a shared opinion that to their own tribe uh, appears coherent and reasonable, but to the other tribe appears incoherent and irrational. And irrational. And, and there's actually a name for this phenomenon. I'm not just making this stuff up. It, it's, it's called confirmation bias. And psychology tells us that everyone, everyone is susceptible to these patterns of thinking that divide people. Lecturing on this subject, Kevin De La Plante suggested that people have a tendency to not only be influenced by their own cultural group towards various issues, but also that our minds tend to take shortcuts. Our minds tend to take shortcuts, causing us to agree or to, to tend to agree with people from our own political tribes, our own cultural tribes, simply because it feels better. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican, whatever tribe you belong to, you likely hold views that you hold because it feels good. I mean, I likely hold views that I hold because it, it feels good. It feels good to belong to a side, and it feels good to 
to make an enemy of the other side, and it feels bad to hold a different view than your own people, whoever your own people are. Perhaps the church has perpetuated some of this. If I may offer a critique of religion, I'd say that church teaching has often tried to dictate what people are supposed to believe, how people are supposed to live, and how people are supposed to act, and and that the church has understood unity as meaning that people need to agree with church teaching, which isn't so much unity, in my opinion, as much as it is conformity. And that's sort of my argument in today's sermon, that that what many people call unity is actually conformity, and that unity is something much more spiritual, that unity is something that is much more life-giving than conformity. And and I don't know about you, but that's that's what I need more of today. I I need less of this endless arguing and fighting between this side and and this side, that that fighting that goes nowhere, and and more joy and more happiness and, 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 and more of what comes from deep within that has the power to transform relationships and transform lives and settle fears and and bring light into the darkest places of the world. And that's that's what I find in today's uh, scripture reading. That's what I find in Paul's letter to the Philippians. Philippians has been called by scholars the letter of friendship. It's generally a a positive and encouraging letter that that promotes themes like uh, togetherness and fellowship. And and in the passage that we just read earlier, Paul is encouraging the church to embrace unity. He says, be of the same mind, have the same love, be in full accord, and be of one mind. And if we go with that assumption that we've received in in our, our modern era, It might sound like Paul is telling Christians to share the same opinion, to share the same perspective. In other words, agree with one another. But what we actually find is Paul further elaborating on what he means, and it means something completely different. He writes, Do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility, and regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. And so for Paul, being of the same mind didn't mean having the the right opinion. It didn't mean having the right ideology or belonging to the right group or the right party or the right tribe. It meant having an attitude of compassion, just as Christ is compassionate. It meant humbling oneself just as Christ is humble. It meant caring for others just as Christ is cares. Just as Christ emptied himself for the world and everyone in it, Paul believed that Christians should sacrifice their self-importance and regard others as better than themselves. And that, to me, just sounds like a radical message to, to regard others as better than yourself. It's my perception that Paul's not just talking about regarding those who you have a high opinion of as being better than yourselves. He's, actually, he's also talking about regarding those who you have a low opinion of as being better than yourselves. I just think that's a radical message. Paul's understanding of unity, then, is to seek to live together in spite of difference. And perhaps he was even encouraging Christians to seek to live together in celebration of differences. Christina Cleveland, a social psychologist and Christian theologian, interprets this passage from Philippians in context of our differing, differing opinions in America regarding race. On one side, 
a group proclaiming black lives matter, on the other side a group proclaiming all lives matter. And, and, and she was preaching on this one morning uh, at morning chapel at Azusa Pacific University. She gave the message that to be of one mind meant for people of different backgrounds and people of different perspectives to come together and become one, that, that, that people don't have to see eye to eye in order to walk shoulder to shoulder. And herein lies this, this paradox associated with unity. That in seeking to be our true selves, that in seeking to be our authentic selves, and not expecting others to conform, but instead celebrating others for who they are as their authentic selves, as people made in the image of God. We participate in, true, in the true fellowship of the Christian faith, a fellowship that is grounded by humility and positive regard for others, even between those in which there is deep division in the rest of society. Because it's in this capacity for the spiritual community to love one another and to embrace each other's differences that that's what sets the church apart for a sacred purpose. And, and, and perhaps this sacred purpose isn't just a Christian thing. There's a, a conversation between Archbishop Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama. And, and this conversation took place over the course of a week, and it was recorded in uh, their book called The Book of Joy. And, 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 and the Dalai Lama is quoted in this book as saying this. He says, On this planet, over the last 3,000 years, different religious traditions have developed. All of these traditions carry the same message, the message of love. And so, the Dalai Lama goes on to say, the purpose of these different traditions is to promote and to strengthen the value of love and compassion. So these different traditions bring us different medicine, but each has the same aim. To cure our pain, to cure our illness. Can it be that spiritual unity and faith and growing and love and compassion and selflessness is the medicine to cure our divisions, to cure our pain, to cure our, to cure our illness? Can it be that letting go of our self-importance And truly being ourselves while at the same time celebrating others for being who they are can be a source of healing. I don't know, but I get the sense that that's where Jesus is leading the church. I get the sense that Jesus is leading the church to become less centered on, on doctrine and, and more centered on relationships. I get the sense that Jesus is leading the church to become more inclusive and more welcoming. I get the sense that Jesus is leading the church to, to recognize the sacred worth of all people. I get the sense that Jesus is leading the church to embrace love without expectations as a core value. I get the sense that Jesus is leading the church to embrace spiritual unity. To become one body with different body parts, different gifts. And as we gather to today, I believe that Jesus is leading us to embrace one another. I'll leave you with this. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of the most celebrated theologians of the 20th century, wrote this Christianity means community through Jesus Christ, and in Jesus Christ. No Christian community is more than this, 
No Christian community is less than this. Whether it be a brief, single encounter or the daily fellowship of years, Christian community is only this. We belong to one another. Only through and in Jesus Christ. No matter who we are, no matter our opinions, no matter our backgrounds. We belong to one another. And so may we be a community through Christ and in Christ, in communion with Christ and in communion with one another. Amen. gratitude of all that God has done and is doing to reconcile people into the family of God. We, we give thanks, we offer a portion of what we have and who we are, trusting that God is using our gifts to strengthen the church's ministries through our prayers, through our presence, through our gifts, through our service, and through our witness. If you would like to uh, give an offering to the church, you may do so. Um, by coming forward and placing that in the offering plate. For those who are joining us online, if you would like to give, there is a link in the description of this video. If you'd like to give online, you may do so. Uh, And and, um, before we do that, I just want to offer some context. After the offering, we're going to have a a, a prayer like we normally do. Um, This is a prayer that comes from the United Methodist Discipleship Ministries, and I want to offer some context. Uh, The United Methodist Church is celebrating the life and the legacy of John Lewis, uh, a prominent civil rights um, uh, figure uh, who died in 2020. And so uh, the prayer uses his language that he used um, in his fight for uh, justice, racial justice. And so if you have a tither offering that you'd like to bring forward, I invite you to do so at this time as we receive this morning's offertory.
us pray. God of justice and mercy, the temptation is strong to make our gifts to you on Sunday feel as if we've done all that is expected, then wake up on Monday and live like all the rest of the world. Deep in our souls, we know that's not what Christ called us to do, but the safe road is so much easier. God of compassion, embolden us to be involved in some good trouble. Embolden us to stand out against the backdrop of a world that says, take care of your own. Embolden us to use our voices to speak on behalf of the voiceless, to use our ears to hear the discouraged and defeated, and to use our arms to help the weak and powerless. In the name of the one who conquered death. Amen. Go and be blessed, sharing the love of Jesus with others. May the grace of God, the love of Christ, and the fellowship and unity of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.